Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to Milton Keynes Literature Festival and welcome to the first of two events that we're running with the team from Grist Books around this rather wonderful anthology. We're all in it together, Poems for a Disunited Kingdom. We have 15 poets from the book this evening and very shortly I'll be handing over to Michael Stewart from the University of Huddersfield who's been absolutely central in putting the book together to tell us all about more about how the book came to be. Uh, if you don't already have a copy of the book I will also be posting a link to uh, Fox Lane Books where you can order a copy online in the chat window. Uh, before I hand over to Michael uh, a few bits of housekeeping before we, uh, before we get underway. We will be recording this evening's event to put a, a video onto YouTube uh, afterwards. So if you don't want your, your wonderful face to appear on camera, uh, please feel free to turn your video off uh, if you wish. We would rather see your happy smiling faces, but if modesty forbids, that's absolutely fine and we understand. Uh, if you have any questions for the poets or any comments or feedbacks on, on the poems uh, as you hear them this evening, please feel free to post those in the chat. And if there are questions for this evening's poets, we'll take those at the end of the event. Um, <clears throat> tonight is a free event. Uh, like any organisation, we have some running costs. If you haven't made a donation to the festival and you are financially flush enough to consider doing so, uh, just find your way to the festival's uh, website where you'll find a link to make a donation on the homepage. No obligation, but it would be very gratefully received. Uh, there is a second part of uh, this event happening on Wednesday evening at 7.30pm. If you already have the same the Zoom link, the same link, Zoom link will get you in a second time, and it would be lovely to see you again. And if you would like to know more about uh, other events, uh, or to find out more about the festival in general, uh, get to our website, you can sign up for a newsletter, or you can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all as at MKLitFest. Uh, and I think I can stop reading my script now and say, time for me to hand over to Michael Stewart, who is going to both read for us and tell us more about how this amazing anthology came into being. Welcome, Michael. The floor is yours. Um, so thank you, Dave, um, very much for that introduction and for the invite. And thank you to the Milton Keynes Literary Festival for hosting this event. Um, this anthology, we're all in it together, is I think our 10th, uh, maybe, something like that. So I set Grist up in 2009, and it's the in-house publication of University of Huddersfield. And we tried to bring one out once a year, but actually we've not succeeded every year. Um, and we've, we've published a range of different things really, but what we wanted to do with this book was to publish a kind of state of the nation anthology of poetry. Um, it felt very much coming out of lockdown um, that we had a problem in the sense of who we were, how we identified um, post, I guess, post empire really, post everything. Um, what does it mean to be British? Do you describe yourself as English from the UK, Northern, Southern? So the whole the whole idea of what it meant to be British seemed uh, very much um, uncertain, really. And we wanted to have a, a, a chance to commission some of the best writers we knew to to submit their poetry kind of response to that that thing, really. Um, and this is how it came about. So we we commissioned fifty one poets. Uh, some very known, uh, well-known poets, such as Joel Taylor, Ian Dewig, and so on. It's right down to people that had never had the work published. So there's quite a few um, uh, poets in here who have never been published before. So that's what it came about. And we, there's three of us. I'm the, the kind of editor-in-chief, but also we had Steve, Eli, and Kelly Campbell as well. So the three of us worked together over a very short period. It's the quickest... Uh, process of any book I brought out. We put the call out in September, the deadline was December, and the book was out, you know, uh, well, the, the, the proof copy was out by January. So um, it was an incredibly quick turnaround. Anyway, so what I'll, what I'll do is I'll read out my poem, and then I'll hand it over to 
Um, whoever's next, really. Um, my mother tells me this story. My mother, whose family are Irish, uh, tells me a story of my grandfather coming over from Ireland as a young man and, uh, and not being served in pubs in, in Salford, where they lived. And I think this poem is kind of inspired by that story, really. It's called No Dogs. Dog couldn't get served in the grain and hop. The barman pointed to a sign on the back bar. No dogs. He wanted to see the Renaissance watercolours exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum. The receptionist refused to print him a ticket. But he ducked the rope at the entrance. He skipped the miniatures of Anne of Cleves, went straight to the Jacob Jordians. When he tried to book for Gotterdammerung, the online system rejected his Amex card. The sommelier at the Dorchester said the wine was too complex for his palate. He was kicked out of Fortnum and Mason's by two goons in top hats and tails, even though he'd prepaid for the food dye hamper. He padded grey pavements, doors latched, hasped, boarded and hooked. Then the rain came down, lead shot fell from pewter clouds, dog looked for shelter, every bar and every public house. No dogs, no dogs, no dogs, no dogs. His fur clung to his skin, rain ran down the gutter of his nose, he shook his coat and shivered. He traipsed through North Parade, along the main road out of town. He hit the fields east of the city, the dust of his feet into the country, dusk, frost, feet, warm. Needed a roof over his head to rest his bones. Out on the edge of Tong Moor, a farmhouse glowed on a hill, warm lights poured and puddled. A sclerotic farmer slammed the door, it was a big, fat, bald no. Found a kennel by a mistal, Trudged to the mouth of its entrance, barred, bolted, barbed, razor wired, topped by two combi locks, and a sign above the lintel No fucking dogs. So that's my poem, No Dogs, and I think we're going to hand over now, Dave, to another Gris poet. Yes, um, thanks, Michael. Um, for the introduction and your wonderful work. Um, I'm Anne Caldwell and I'm really delighted to be part of this anthology. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called Bridges Are Restless Places, Neither Here Nor There, and it's a prose poem. There's a slatted bridge over a burn deep in the Galloway Forest. Pine trees hold the banks together and the air is risen thick. This is the kind of bridge where a car might stop and a mine man climb out, checking for passing traffic and click open the boot. But not today. A woman in a Skoda has spent hours on a winter motorway. She pauses for a break and twists open a flask of coffee. The bridge creaks a little, like a knee joint flexing. She's driving to see her lover. Will she still recognise his smell? What on earth will they say to each other after all those daily texts about politics, the morning weather, rapid flow testing and their virtual lives? There are trolls beneath the arches of her mind. She can hear them smirking. You won't like that roll of Christmas fat around your belly. You won't want to spend hours with this dumb creature you've become. So much water under the bridge. She's a woman who's misplaced herself, whose body quivers with elvers. Should she turn back? Her house is so silent, you can hear field mice in the attic. Lovely, thank you. Um, would you like to put any uh, contact details or social media that you have in the chat so that other people can find out more about you? That'd be lovely. Thank you very much. Our next reader this evening is Ben Willems. Ben lives in Manchester and has been writing and performing poetry for nearly 20 years. His writing is inspired by political slapstick, social static, internet traffic, 
Rearranging Titanic Deck Chair Levels of International Head Clutter. He's been published by Some Roast Poets, The Recusant, Beatification, and Citizen 32, among others. Welcome, Ben. If you would like to unmute yourself and, uh, and read us your poems, that would be lovely. Thank you. Oh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, it's great to be part of this event. Um, so this poem is called Rachel from Swindon. Uh, if people aren't aware of uh, Rachel from Swindon, she's uh, a left-wing Twitter personality who sort of came through during the Corbyn years. Uh, Rachel from Swindon. They're going to work on Rachel from Swindon. This is the Corbyn shakedown. This is the proverbial Orgreave truncheon class conjunction. She's on a list with Damo and Red Till I'm Dead. All you curtain twitchers, clothesline snitchers, dirt, dirt, going through bins like a Russian accessory. She's from Swindon, but it could have been Warrington. Milkshake Marty in a Barrett home box room. She's Jennifer Aniston meets Ricky Tomlinson. While you were channeling Del Boy and Frank Spencer, the TV stars got older. Many ball bag, Alan Sugar. All the fakes rinsed out fake in the food bank queue. Marcus Rashford, social welfare, 21. The fence patrollers are losing their collective Ron Seal shit. Blacklist! What? You can't blacklist Marcus Rashford. FFS, think about it. Make it about her trainers, implied lifestyle. And who gives her that platform? Voices of the humdrum towns. Speak up wet verges for the real gutter press. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, our next part is Charlotte Murray. Charlotte, are you, are you with us? Hello, I am. Excellent. <laughs> Let me introduce you. Uh, Charlotte Murray is a writer from West Yorkshire. She won second place in Bangor Literary Festival, Literary Journal's 40 Words competition and Lucent Dreamings Poetry Competition 2021. She's been published in various journals and anthologies, including CP Quarterly, The Winnow, The Winnow, no, um, Mancunian Ways Anthology and New Beginnings Anthology. Charlotte, welcome to MK Look First. Um, we're looking at your poem. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction and for choosing my poem to be part of this fantastic anthology. Um, this poem came from an exercise that I did as part of the Hive Poetry Collective, which is a group for young writers. Um, and that was to write about an aspect of British culture, a festival or a holiday. So I chose to write a poem about the Pacehead plays and um, that take place in Hepton Stall every Good Friday. It's been a family tradition that we've gone to watch them every year, but at that point we'd missed the last couple of years due to COVID. So I think that was why it came to mind. Um, it's also an area that has a darker side though. It has a lot of drug problems. So in my poem, I've tried to bring out those two aspects. So this is Good Friday in the Calder Valley. On Hepton Stall's main street, boots hammer a beat on the cobblestones under the clink of home sewn costumes. They ring out over the valley while church bells hang still and muted beside Weaver's Square. Faces protrude from the windows of soot darkened cottages. A homage to mince pies begins and builds to a boom echoing from stone. Some know the words by heart. By the graveyard wall, St. George leaps at bold slasher with a clack of wooden swords. His roar sends crows scattering from branches. Three kisses for a cream egg. Some women push to the front, smiles like headlights. Others duck behind cagoule packs. Baskets empty of still warm buns, blended with flowery crosses. A torrent of coins waterfalls into plastic buckets. Some years, icicles drape from plaits headstone. Today, bluebells lean out, listening. Beer flows from plastic steins like the river through the veil and footsteps become unsteady stones to walk across. Words are forgotten and invented. Swords clash and clash again, watched by a translucent moon peering over the rolling cloud bank. 
Outside the cross, a hog roast spits where the coiners once silenced a man with fire. On the muddy track to Hardcastle crags, dust gathers behind walls, beneath trees, their leaves trembling under the wind's bluster. A bag is slipped from a cold fist to a sweaty palm. Thank you. Charlotte, thank you. That was a great poem. Moving on, uh, let me introduce Jack Ferrisy. Jack is a poet and English teacher who's studying for a PhD in creative writing at the University of Huddersfield. He's working on a series of poems exploring the M62 and the landscape that, that it connects and divides. His first collection, Traces, is published by Calder Valley Poetry, and you can find him on Twitter as at Woodsuckers. Welcome, Jack. And please take it away. Hi there, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to read two if that's all right, but they're short. Uh, yeah, I've been hanging around uh, the M62 quite a lot and um, it's not always pretty and uh, sometimes it feels like a bit of a microcosm for the state of the nation. Uh, this is commuters. Standing in a muddy tunnel under eastbound traffic where the farmer keeps pallets and breeze blocks and bulk bags of logs, I watch the pulsing rain come in off the moors, the pummeling wind the gust whipped waves crashing over the rim and gushing down the spillway in white curved surges. And even though it's grim, I'd rather be stuck here than up there with them. Uh, and this next poem is, is not from the anthology, but I think it fits the brief. Um, given that music and the arts are something that unite us, um, and given that Rishi Sunak is the bookie's favourite uh, to become our next prime minister, uh, I thought I'd read this, which is a response to his comments um, in 2020 about struggling musicians needing to retrain to find other jobs. Um, so this is the muses retrained. Calliope is a publicist, a specialist in spin. When Zeus is on disgrace's brink, she weaves a net for him. Clio, a data analyst at the Office for Public Health still can't believe Apollo's using Microsoft Excel. Euterpe writes the jingles for Taiki's advertising firm, but what her bosses hear as music is literally a worm. Thalia's an Uber driver in the outskirts of hell. The dead laugh at her Hades jokes and feed her asphodel. Melpomene's a coroner at the Leafy's biggest morgue. She'll make it look like suicide if it only serves the cause. Terpsichore is in cyber, defending crypto systems, but she's really making robots to strengthen the resistance. Arato took a coding course and designed a dating app that matches gods with mortals, but it's actually a trap. Polyhymnia is a therapist with some influential clients. Olympians share their secret thoughts and think she'll keep them quiet. Urania's project managing a band of mad resistors. She scrolls to see on her prepaid phone, starts summoning her sisters. Thank you. And it's a, a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be in the anthology. Thank you very much. A, ple a pleasure to have you here, Jack. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking as you started reading the second poem, I don't know if anybody else was, was uh, having the guilty afternoon television pleasure of Pointless this evening. Uh, one of the rounds was name people that were in the, the cabinet after the 2021 cabinet reshuffle. And somebody thought the chancellor was called Richie Sumac, which I think is an Arabic spice. And somebody said Liz Truss and three out of 100 people have heard of it. And I just started thinking, well, maybe that has kind of put them in their place after all. Uh, it's quite an eye-opening moment. Yeah. Yeah. Who do we have next? Ah, yes. Reading for us next, uh, please welcome John Newsham. John's novel, Killing the Horses, was published by Wrecking Ball Press in 2021. His short story of the same name was longlisted for the Manchester Fiction Prize. He's won accolades for his poetry and has performed at festivals across the north of England. He lives in West Yorkshire, and you can find him on Twitter as at Writer, all one word. And we're delighted to have him here this evening. John, please read for us. 
Yeah, thank you. I'll just give a uh, very short introduction because this is quite a long poem. I'm a bit disappointed not to be able to compete with the hacker, to be honest, as well. But um, um, this this poem is it's a little bit tongue in cheek. It's um, it was my attempt to respond to the, to the brief that Michael put out there about the sort of div divisiveness of, of British political debate, and the only way I could think to do that was to um, sort of develop this uh, this trickster figure. Um, so the poem is called It. It's on page 66 for those who have a copy of the anthology. And It is this little trickster figure who goes around sort of upsetting people across, across Britain, basically. So this is the poem. It starts with a trigger warning straight out of the birth canal. What lies ahead may cause upset. It logs onto Twitter and prefers not to use its own name. It takes a shit on the Union Jack. It wipes its arse with the EU stars. It takes the Tory politician and sticks him in a council flat he can't afford to heat. It tells him to budget. It takes the Labour politician and sticks her in the council flat next door, the one with the nice red curtains and fuck all inside. It can't remember the name of a single Lib Dem. It rounds up all the centrists and the BBC reporters with public school accents and supply teacher smiles. It drops them into a cell with an Overton window and no door. It drags everyone out of the House of Lords and tells them to fuck off. It taps the Brexiteer on the shoulder. It, it tells him he's thick as shit. It taps the Remainer on the shoulder. It inquires, why do you think you lost? Could you not articulate the arguments that would have demonstrated your superior intellect? It walks away, whistling. It screams select lines from Siegfried Sassoon through the two minute silence. It covers itself in poppies and departs from the cenotaph in a nuclear submarine. It takes the culture warriors, the woke and the anti-woke, the PC mob and the anti-PC mob. It invents problems for them to ponder like a Zen master. Did you know if you speak English during Ramadan, you get arrested and sent to a jail where all the food is halal? It takes the cisgender man and the turf and the white woman and the woman of colour and the man of colour and the lesbian of colour and the homosexual of no colour and it pretends to be confused. It gives the men's rights activist a slap on the arse and tells the feminist to man up. It takes the binary and the non-binary and the bisexual and the bicurious and says, by the time we've labelled us all, we'll set the whole world right. They look nonplussed. It grins. It takes the Muslim and the Christian and the Jew. It leads them through the checkpoint past the armed Israeli guards. It takes them to the tomb of Abraham and asks them what would happen if we pulled him out. It makes them hold hands in a circle and pray. It leaves to use the toilet. It reads the atheist a poem and asks him to underline the metaphors. It pats him on the head. It woos the agnostic and sits and holds her hand. It potters off. It takes all of the fascists and it marches them to Auschwitz. It bolts those awful doors and turns on the gas. It hears them gasp. It rounds up all the communists at gunpoint in the middle of the night. It locks them in the gulag. It makes them debate class theory and human ideals while they starve and scheme against each other. It lines them up against the wall. It takes me, then it takes you. It takes everybody else. All of us who know we've seen the light. It leads us to the darkness to that place where every one of us is wrong. It ends. It ends with a trigger warning, right there with the final gasp. What lies ahead may cause upset. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next poet for you this evening is Joseph Blythe. Joseph is a 22-year-old writer of prose from Yorkshire. Having written since a young age, he's never had any doubts about what he wants to do with his life, but often finds himself writing too much and studying too little. Uh, 40 years ago, I think I would have said the same, Joseph, so I know where you're coming from. Uh, you can find him on Twitter as at Wooperark, W-O-O-P-E-R-A-R-K. Um, we're delighted to say he'll be waiting for you right now. Hello, Joseph. Hello everyone. Um, I realise now having written that bio, it's probably a good job I haven't had my 23rd birthday because otherwise it would have been wrong, wouldn't it? Um, so I'm going to attempt to follow up John, um, even though I really, really love that poem. And I've got two for you today. Um, the first one is the one that's in the anthology. It's quite a short poem, so I thought I'd, I'd also read something else that I've been working on. 
afterwards. So um, this is the poem from the anthology. This, this is called Judas. I have drive, but I cannot steer. I have dreams, yet I cannot sleep. I have faith, though I never pray. I have a voice, but I do not speak. I have a pen, but I cannot write. I have words, but I have no tongue. And I have eyes, but I have seen enough. They have hearts, but they know not love. Thank you. And, oh, having some, I haven't actually printed off the second one you see, it's still on my laptop. So I was having some slight performance issues there. <coughs> so this is the first part of something longer I'm working on. Um, this, this is like it's about six stanzas uh, entitled The Church Choir. Um, it's loosely inspired by numerous different things. Um, the, the bit that's the thing that sort of started me writing it was uh, a trip to London I took back in May, April, something like that. Um, and how after walking around London for about 36 hours, I came to the conclusion that I absolutely hate it. So, um, yes, this is the church choir. Turbine blades cut wings from birds, the city streets take air from my lungs. Puncture in the organ, the notes echo against church walls. Straight roads meet and cross, and I am nailed upon them, writhing in the scorching sun like a pariah in the desert. The bridge as vibrato runs through me as if I am a tuning fork, the screeching audible to all around. Listen to the music I make. You can hide things in the darkness like the dirt on the walls of the half-constructed building with a hole in its soul. I think the memories have come for me finally and might have let them in. I saw a road sign and a postcode and I sank into the Thames. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. You were reminding me in your introduction then of a friend who, who lives in a tiny village in Devon and has done her entire life. And I remember being somewhat taken aback when she said she'd been to London once uh, and she'd, she'd gone by coach, she'd taken the tube to Oxford Street, she'd, she'd walked to Tottenham Court Road, decided that she'd had enough of London and went back <laughs> to Victoria and got the coach back to Devon. So I've, I've seen London now, I don't think I like it. And, you know, having grown up there and thinking, yeah, I came to the same conclusion, but it took me an awful lot longer. Uh, okay, our, our next poet this evening is Kevin Higgins. Uh, let me find your bio, Kevin. Bear with me a second. Kevin was born in London and lives in Galway in Ireland. In 2016, the Stinging Fly magazine described him as likely the most read living poet in Ireland. He's published five poetry collections and a new one selected with salmon poetry. And his sixth collection, Ecstatic, was published in March 2022. Kevin, welcome to Little Keen's Lit Fest. Um, we're looking forward Hi, to hearing you. Hi, and uh, great to be here, and thanks for organising this. I know the sort of work that goes into these things. And uh, I'm going to read a poem from the anthology, and uh, just when you said that we had five minutes, I popped out to get a, a related poem. Uh, this poem is called Island, and it's, it was written at the uh, in the kind of mayhem of the uh, second half of 2019. And uh, it's after, uh, inspired by a poem by Wyslow Sinborska, the Polish Nobel Prize winner, Island. Where men with shiny scalps fight for the right to die, here they no longer have any color they want. Here, garbage can be magicked into its opposite by the mere act of attaching to it the word great. Proud nation that plays redundant assembly line, assembly line operators to sell photoshopped versions of itself to tourists from its former colonies, raised voices in its cathedral city tea rooms, so shrill a cup gets chipped in the course of the argument and a scone scone is left behind on the plate. The roses around its cottage gates try to forget but elsewhere the dead factory remembers and the disgraced estate agent tries to secure the door on what was once British home stores, but can't.
fathom the lock. And that's from this great anthology. The second poem is the first poem I wrote, kind of inspired by the increasing desperation of a friend of mine, uh, Daryl, who lives at Portsmouth, who has done a great amount to support the French economy by going back and over on the ferry to buy uh, um, wine. And uh, I dedicated this to, for Daryl Cavanagh in his hour of need, and it was written in June 2016. Exit. There will be no more thunderstorms sent across the channel by the French, no acid rain floating in from Belgium. Pizza Hut will offer a choice of Yorkshire pudding or Yorkshire pudding. You'll spend the next 27 bank holidays dismantling everything you've ever bought from Ikea. The electric shower your plumber Pavel put in last week will be taken out and you'll be given the number of a bloke who's pure billericky. Those used to caviar will have jelly deals forced down their magnificent throats. Every fish and chip shop on the Costa del Sol will in time relocate to Ramsgate or Carlisle. All paving stones laid by the Irish will be torn up to make work for blokes who've been on the sick since 1976. Those alleged to be involved in secretly making spaghetti bolognese will be arrested and held in a detention center near Dover. Sausage dogs will be put in rubber dinghies and pointed in the general direction of the fatherland. Neatly sliced French sticks topped with pate will make way for fried bread lathered with marmite. There'll be no more of those new names for coffee your gran can't pronounce. The entire royal family will be shipped back to Bavaria, with the exception of the Duke of Edinburgh, who will be given a one-way ticket to Athens. Curry will no longer be compulsory after every 12th pint of Stella, which itself will only be available by special permission of the Foreign Office. We'll give India back its tea, sit around increasingly bellicose campfires in our rusting iron helmets, our tankards overflowing with traditional Norse mead. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> A much needed chuckle in, in times like these. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and next part is Mia. Mia, I, I see that you've turned your camera. Would you like to turn it back on and read for us, please? And let me introduce you in a second. Mia Rayson Regan is an aspiring young writer from Leeds and is currently studying English literature with creative writing at the University of Huddersfield. She was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 18, but uses the challenges of her disability to craft and develop her writing. You can find it on Twitter at, at Mia Rayson 8. And let's welcome her to, to Mountain Games. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Mia, and read for us. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd just like to add to that because I realise I've done the very similar thing as Sam. I have now actually graduated as of last Friday, but I'm still at Huddersfield. Um, I've got a scholarship to study uh, creative writing as a master's in September, which I'm really excited about. Um, so my poem in the anthology is inspired by my mum. Uh, during the pandemic, she worked in 2020, April 2020, she worked in the COVID ICU. She's here somewhere. I'm not, I can't see her on here, but I know she's still here. Um, and I think the experience was challenging for all of us, but particularly for the NHS. So this is about that. And it's called The Cold Ring. A child's bloodshot eyes glisten on his mother's first time screen as she takes her final agonizing breath. A woman in the car park slumped over the wheel, fighting to keep her eyelids open as her husband lies motionless, tangled in plastic tubes. An old man fighting to raise his arm as he gasps for his little girl in his granddad's voice, but no one comes because no one can. A doctor with dark rings above his mask, shrunk in his head like the eyes of a skull, as he phones a fifth family to tell them that grandma is dead. 
a couple admitted together, matching gold rings. She fights to live as he fights for life. Soon she leaves, the warm ring on her left finger, the cold ring on her right. Um, and then I've got a second poem, which I wrote as part of um, a collaboration that the Huddersfield Creative Writing Society, which me and Joseph are part of, um, and we did a collaboration with the Art Society. Um, I'm going to put our Instagram into the uh, chat, but if any writer is up in Huddersfield next year, I'm the social secretary for the society next year, and we'll be doing lots of open mics with Chris. So if you want to get involved, you want to be a guest speaker, please get in contact with us or Michael, and we'll be happy to host you. Um, so this is called Vital Organs, and this is about having a disability and how that affects everyday life and how that affects the mental health. When you got sick, I didn't notice. I carried on my day unaware of the medication you needed. When you got sick, I fell on edge. I turned to drink to hide your symptoms, but the cold liquid was never enough. I felt hollow, the insides of an old withered tree. All my leaves had blown away. When you were withering, I felt numb. I curled up and tried to sink underground trying not to feel the longing for you. When you left me, my brain froze over. The glaciers had replaced the beautiful val valley. Oh, how I missed the flowers and the birds that migrated. When you were gone, I was in pain. You replaced me with a click, a prick, a stab, the cracking of an icy lake. When you were dying, so was I. My smiles were leaving and so were you, dying, dying. Ted. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the scholarship too. Please keep writing. Uh, our next fight tonight is Nick Allen. Nick is going to be reading to us by video. Uh, let me introduce him and I shall share screen and play the video that he sent us. Nick Allen has published one collection and three pamphlets of poetry, the most recent. Uh, Mayfair, sorry, May Tree Press 2021 being a limited edition with all proceeds to the NHS called M Morphine Bone Dream. And you can find Nick on Twitter as Nick underscore Alan underscore poet. Ghoul voted leave. Waking in the alley behind Jefferson Street. The sky has lines of perspective drawing the gaze to unexpected places like a painting by Birdle or a Mondrian reappraisal of space. Wires spoke from the telegraph pole, cutting the sky into pie-sliced portions, a chart that wants to represent something I lack the tools to grasp. Perhaps the number of syringes found on the footbridge over the tracks on each day of the week since January. Perhaps children going to school without a warm meal, or the number of people have had their benefits cut because they are deemed fit to work. Black and green bruises line the street that can't find the right track. Sheets pinned as make-do curtains across peeling frames and a satellite dish rusting on the wall of each house, capturing nothing worthwhile from the ether. These tight terraces, once filled with dock workers, railwaymen, and landlocked sailors, the people whose industry filled Lowther's murals. Now town walls hum with misspelling and misappropriation, comparing Brexiteers with suffragettes. No more blood alley, just a street with the weather spoons, a Greg's making hot dinners for everyone, and the youngest junkie in Britain according to the local rag. It's Nick Allen reading for you all. Um, right, this evening is Robin Gurney. Uh, Robin is a writer, performer and avid researcher. Fascinated by the liminal and monstrous, Robin finds inspiration in folklore, nature and their own queerness and disability. Selected past works and current projects from Old English translation soundscapes to a full-length fringe show 
are catalogued at robinredford.card. That's C-A-R-R-D dot co. You can find, her, find them on Facebook at at Red Hoods and Glass Slippers. Welcome, Robin. And it'd be a pleasure to hear you read. Thank you. Um, this poem is called Bog and Fen. Um, it's something that I think I've been wanting to write for a while. <laughs> um, as someone who um, has studied um, folklore and Anglo-Saxon history, um, I find it very frustrating when uh, when people invoke a particular image of the past in order to justify their you know white nationalist bullshit <laughs> um, and uh, yeah that, that's that's basically where this poem came from when you tell me you are English to the core I think of old wetland trees whose insides rot away and leave their trunk a hollow rib cage. I see you grasping for your strong, pure heartwood and finding only mess, decay, that which time has transformed beyond understanding. There is no pure in Anglo-Saxon. The very term is hybrid. Millennia of inward moving tracks have left this body politic lattice worked with scars. Angles, Saxons, Dukes, Britons, Danes, Romans, Normans, all were swallowed by the land in bones and blood, their boundaries blurring further each time we till the earth. You and I are not indigenous for being white and born here. There is no unspoilt heritage to claim. We're mongrels bred by brutal tides. This isle of mist and rain and shivers was colonized so many times. Our oldest gods were lost to memory. Our metals drained for Rome. Then we turned tyrant, spread across the world like creeping damp to fill that hollow hearted tree with stolen gold with bodies, stories, everything that caught our eyes, as if theft could replace long missing things. Once invaded, then invaders. We are not victims now. And when you talk of invasions taking place today, tidal waves of immigration, no. Learn our history. These waves are ripples from the storms we caused, washing up the drowning and displaced on this hostile shore, and you treat them with hate, as if our ancestors didn't cross the sea to come here too? As if our ancestors didn't torture, rape, and chain a quarter of the world? When you try to claim that English core, that heartwood, I think of bogs and fens. A fen nourishes, a bog preserves. Dredge it and you'll find bodies, teeth and hair and leather, frightful perfect, clothes and jewelry set in place. The wounds that killed them open still. You cannot scour their skin to vellum and chart on it some unbroken family line that makes their world less alien and folds it into your imagined noble past. Botanists will tell you, heartwood is already dead, its purpose served. Rotting sets it free. It turns back into earth, feeds the roots it sprang from. A bog preserves, a fen nourishes, with decomposing plants and constant water flow from somewhere else. We could scrabble in the mire for long dead kings to resurrect, or we could see abundance and decay and let the fantasy of England rot. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Uh, our next slide this evening is Rory Waterman. Uh, Rory's full length collections, all published by Calcumet Press. Uh, tonight, the summer is over, a Poetry Book Society recommendation and shortlisted for a Seamus Hindi Award. Sarajevo Roses, which was shortlisted for the Library Forte Prize, and Sweet Nothings. He also wrote Brexit Day on the Balmoral Estate, uh, RAC 2017. And he's on the English fac faculty at Nottingham Trent University. You can find him on Twitter as at Rory Waterman. And it's a pleasure to have him reading for us here tonight. Hello, Rory. And it's a pleasure to read for you tonight. Um, and thank you, Michael, particularly for, for doing the anthology and for including me in it. Um, you're a very good writer and uh, I'm grateful that you included me in this. So this realm, this England. He sparks the flint. His face and hands flare amber and grins. The old flame judders in freezing air. He dabs it gently to the moistens jam. Shh, it sighs and takes. We leave it there and when we come past later in the morning, the rafters are charred stumps. The walls are bare and the neighbours gather pointing by police tape, and we nudge to it as close as we dare. And nearby, nestled halfway up a fir, blinking, turning, and though we're not aware of it yet, a camera in a dome reflects our will, then watches us walk home. I'm gonna read a second poem, because that's quite short. Um, it's called Reaping, and it's in the uh, my most recent collection. There it is. Um, sweet nothings. Um, I grew up in Lincolnshire, in, and there are lots of RAF bases in Lincolnshire. I think there are still eight of them. Uh, and yes, this is this is set there. It begins with an epigraph from a retired air marshal, Air Marshal Greg Bagwell, who apparently said this at an after dinner speech. If you can believe it, check this out. We need to test harder whether we can take a young 18 or 19 year old out of their PlayStation bedroom and put them into a Reaper cabin and say, right, you have never flown an aircraft before. That does not matter. You can operate this. 18 or 19. What was I doing then? Well, one day I biked here to RAF Waddington's viewing point from where I saw no action, called by the urgent tornadoes which had skimmed our village, shocking pliant heads at intervals of my childhood and must have come from somewhere. Runway approach lights have switched on and point skyward at nothing coming in. A pigeon, a slip of moon. A screech owl would be too apposite, but I saw one once a mile from here on Bloxholm Lane. It stalled a moment, then beat on past the hedges, high as houses, living its purpose suddenly beyond range. And who knows what they do in a concreted cube 200 yards behind wires and warning signs, or who does. An inch from where it would have died, a sandfly fills its nest. Grasses by the road dip like a million rods to a million tiny catches. A saloon half a mile off indicates only to clouding dusk, slows to corner the perimeter on a red route B road to home. Nothing to do but follow at a generous distance. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. An ultimate poet this evening is Sharon Phillips. Sharon started writing when she retired and her poems have appeared in print and online journals and anthologies, including Places of Poetry, Poetry Birmingham, Rasim, About Larkin, The Poetry Society Newsletter, Atrium, The Clearing, Ink, Sweat and Tears, The High Window and The Friday Poem. And we're delighted to have you with us this evening, Sharon. Please, please read for us. Thanks very much. Um, I'm reading two poems tonight. The first of them is the one from the anthology. It was inspired um, by the German artist Katie Kollwitz, with whom I have a, a long-standing obsession. 
in her diary entry for December 1922. She talks about the millionaire, millenarian sects that were proliferating among Berlin's poor at the time. Um, they thought that Christ would return to earth to rule a thousand year empire of saints, an idea borrowed by Nazi propagandists. You'll have heard of the thousand year Reich. Kolwitz believed her art could steer people away from false beliefs, and she concludes the diary entry by dedicating herself to that aim. Hindsight. It might as well be the 1920s and a man on the street bellowing, the end is nigh, given how weird things have turned. What with those thugs and dupes who dream about the hordes of barbarians besieging our gates? the paedophiles governing the whole world in secret. Her mission might look as clear today as it did a century back. She thought her art could make a difference to the homeless lads with shell shock, people starving to feed their children, the unemployed and the sick. Instead, they dreamt of a thousand year Reich. It seems to me that one of the things we can do in a time of division uh, is to try not to sympathize with, but to understand people who think differently from us and even do things that we might deplore. Uh, in that vein, here's a very different poem about Ethel G. Uh, Ethel was a working class woman from Portland in Dorset who cared for three disabled family members, also worked as an MOD filing clerk, and when she had time, stole naval secrets for the Russians. The poem is named after her MI5 file, codenamed Trellis. If it was you, 40 odd, sneered at for being a spinster, day after day, you care for your mum, your uncle, your aunt, until you can't breathe in the two up, two down terrace. And though you can't see the bay from the house, you can hear it. It's restless grey grinding the beach. It's winds that lurch up the streets and sea frets blocking the sunlight. And at work, you're reliable, careful how you handle the top secret plans. Day after day, you file them away and the boss thinks you're too dim to know exactly what they are. If that was your life and someone offered you money, good money, and you saw what you'd be able to do, how you could live. If that was you, how would you choose? Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and I have one of those weird moments where you introduce yourself in the third person because I am your, your final poet for the, for the evening. Uh, least and very much last, I think. Uh, I've been listening to you all while manipulating God knows how many different computer windows, so I'm going to go back and listen to all of this again, so I'll take it in properly. I'm struck by the the richness and diversity of everything that, that we have all written in response to the same prompt. Um, and I think speaking for me, I, I feel like I've always had a complicated relationship to what does it mean to be British or English. Uh, I've always been aware that both my grandmothers were French. Uh, one grandfather was half Dutch, one, the other grandfather was half Polish. So I'm actually, strictly speaking, more French than I am English. Uh, a lot of European friends. Um, England is a country that physically I love. We have beautiful countryside architecture, fascinating history. But I've always felt that I'm kind of looking at its politics and its social structures kind of askew and and with somewhere between disdain and horror, which is probably where I was coming from, uh, writing the poems that I submitted. Uh, I'm much more of a short story writer than a poet, so it was it was kind of a shock to be accepted for the publication. Uh, and both the poems come with a, a huge apology to Louis McNeese, who's when bagpipe music was almost certainly echoing vaguely in my head while I was writing them. And these were written, they were both written on scraps of paper, stomping through woods on my daily walks during the winter lockdowns. Uh, I think it was the first or second lockdown. Um, not, not like anything else I've, I've written before or since, but um, 
I'll read one for you anyway. This is Bagpipe Music 2022. And I think you all know who I'm basically getting at. Let's all hold hands and pretend it's all house here and nothing's gotten rotten in darling old Albion. How could it be when we've such a fine champion burying his nose in the trough? Look how we sail with this hand on the rudder, this dickhead whose judgments could never be dudder. No matter how fiercely we tremble or shudder, there's just too much piss to shake off. He's putting the villain in villanelle, warping and wefting a cod Latin spell, while he's twinning the Garden of Eden with hell and then skipping off for a shag. He governs in gestures and grand gusts of words, as clotted and curdled as yesterday's curds, selling false hope while we paddle in turds and offering a towel made of flags. Now normality's gone to meet its maker. Shall we welcome the Amish, the Puritans and Quakers, to sort wheat from chaff and heroes from fakers, while we play angry birds on our phones? Let our children dig trenches to plant next year's carrots, to stuff in their ears to silence the parrots, who drown their concerns in subsidised clarets as red as the blood in our bones. Will good things still come if we patiently wait? Or will compost and chalk be our ultimate fate? Let's shake when we meet at heaven's gate and talk about who is to blame. Let latter day Jesus's wring hands for sinners while Mary's stay home and bring them their dinners, pimping the privilege of society's winners. Some things are always the same. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and that's... That was the, our last poem of the evening. I think you should all unmute yourselves and we should all give everybody a round of applause because that's been quite a festival of writing. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. If you're still with us, would you like to, to say some, some words in closing? I just want to say thank you very much, Dave, for hosting that. I thought that was a fantastic uh, session. Um, and I actually haven't seen, I, I haven't realised how few of the contributors have actually seen in the flesh. So it's great to put faces. <laughs> it, it's really weird, isn't it? Because I've read all of those poems many, many times. And um, you have an impression of someone in your head when you read their poem. And it's great to see that confounded and, and challenged, you know. So, <laughs> and I also, whoever the hacker was, well, that was a great, that was a great sort of moment, wasn't it? <laughs> a little hair raising if you're if you're sitting in my seat. You got past it. I do like living life on the edge, and I like those. One of the things about these events is they can be a little bit sterile, can't they? They can be a little bit kind of um, just slightly distanced, really. You know, and, and I'm sure we all prefer to, to do things face to face. And, and those little free songs, those little edges of things where hackers come in or something, because it just gives it a certain a certain <laughs> liveness, doesn't it? You know. Um, so thank you to the hacker, whoever you were. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking forward to Wednesday. Sadly, I can't be there Wednesday. I'm double booked. Um, but it looks like you've got a fantastic lineup for Wednesday. So good luck with that. I have sent a video. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'll be there in spirit. Um, Fabulous. And yeah, good luck with it. And okay. the festival all goes really well. It's a great, great festival. So thank you very much for including us. <laughs>